Hey everyone, welcome back to New Method Live. I'm so excited that you're here today. We have an amazing guest. Again, I was guest on his show about a year ago and I was so impressed by him. Let me tell you all about him. We're talking about Dr. Philip Ovadia. Dr. Philip Ovadia, he is a cardiologist and he's had over 3,000 heart surgeries. Okay, so if anyone understands heart, it's Dr. Ovadia. And he's taught that good health comes from lifestyle nutrition and not to surgery. So actually his book is called Stay Off My Operating Table, which I really love. Sadly, many of his patients consider their heart attacks inevitable, but he went through a personal journey where he lost 100 pounds. He was obese and he was able to overcome lifelong obesity. And since then, he's been on a mission to help people stay off his operating table by teaching them how to never need a heart surgeon through his telehealth practice of Adia Heart Health. So today we're going to like jump in to what cholesterol is, what the myth about cholesterol is. You're not going to want to miss this. Let's talk about the truth about heart disease with Dr. Philip Avadia. Let's do it. Dr. Avadia, I am so excited that you're here. I was so honored to be on your show almost a year ago, and I'm very excited that you're on my show now. So we are entitling this episode today, The Truth About Heart Disease. Why do we need the truth about heart disease? What are we missing? Great to be back with you. We need the truth because, unfortunately, we've been told a lot of lies. And when I say we, I mean we the physicians and I mean we the patients. There's a lot of, maybe you can generously call it misunderstanding, but I think more accurately it needs to be called the lies around heart disease and it's time for us to start spreading the truth. So what are the lies? Yeah, I think the biggest lie is that cholesterol, and especially dietary cholesterol, is the primary driver of heart disease. And this one, like I said, I think we really have to put it in the lie category. And we can look at the history of how we got there. And I think when you look at the dietary story around what is the driver of heart disease, there were a lot of lies told. Maybe there was some misunderstanding and some bad science done along the way. But it got it to a point that the things that have been promoted to help with heart disease are actually making the problem worse. And so we have to get people, patients, to understand that. And over time, we also have to get the doctors to understand that as well. <laughs> that's always, I think that's harder than the patient. But what do you mean specifically? What do you mean by dietary cholesterol? Does that mean we could eat anything we want? Well, no. What we have to look at is because it's clear that something is driving this epidemic of heart disease, right? So we go back to the early 1900s here in the United States, and heart disease is rare. Leading physicians of the time from the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they published their kind of lifelong experience around medicine, you see that heart disease is undescribed. It's a very rare condition. Through the early 1900s, we see a steady increase in the incidence of heart disease. And, you know, 1955, it really reaches a crisis point. The president of the United States, President Eisenhower, has a heart attack while in office. You know, this appropriately sets off the alarm bells. What's going on? Now, some people would say, well, heart disease is a genetic problem. But we know that human genetics don't change that quickly, right? They don't change in 50 or 100 years. They change over millennia and eons. That doesn't really hold water. So something environmental, right, is going on. And food is the obvious culprit. Now, at the time, the leading scientists, the leading clinicians, there was a very robust debate. And the two primary things that people implicated in the development of heart disease was dietary fat and specifically dietary saturated fat found primarily in animal products and sugar. For various reasons, the saturated fat, the dietary kind of cholesterol related to dietary saturated fat, that theory won out. We adopted what was called the diet heart hypothesis. Now again, for people listening, a hypothesis is a theory. It needs to be proven or disproven. I and many others make the argument that the diet heart hypothesis was never proven, still hasn't been proven to this day, and there's lots of evidence that contradicts it, essentially disproves it. But that has been the prevailing theory. 
That then led to dietary recommendations to lower our saturated fat, lower our fat intake overall, which then led to when you take the fat out, you got to put more carbohydrates, more sugar in. And what has the result of that been? More heart disease. As a secondary effect, we said, okay, we're not doing a good enough job with making dietary changes, so now we need medications. Cholesterol-lowering medications came about, and those have been widely prescribed. They seem almost ubiquitous today and have been for the past 30 or 40 years, and heart disease is not going away. It continues to get worse. As a clinician, I look at these things and I say, something doesn't add up here. Why do so many patients end up on my operating table with blood cholesterol levels that don't aren't elevated? And those are the types of questions that I started asking and kind of got me started on this journey. So what I mean, I just want to make sure I kind of already know how you feel, but I want to make sure our audience gets it. So what we're saying is we had this heart disease a few decades ago. And we made this decision that it must be the animal protein and saturated fat, and it can't possibly be the sugar. Since then, we made a decision to, when we talk about heart healthy, is to say, hey, don't eat too many steaks. Hey, don't eat too many animal products. But what we should have been focusing on is, hey, how about cutting down the sugar? Is that what you're saying? That's, I would say, the majority of it. You know, now there are some other things that we could bring in. We can talk about the vegetable and the seed oils, these processed oils that, again, were developed and introduced into the food supply primarily on the basis that they're going to lower our blood cholesterol levels. And therefore, they must be good and they must be heart healthy. You know, you see the heart healthy label right on the bottle. Yeah. Uh, but again, it would... And I would say that when we really dig into the science under that, what we find is these things don't seem to have any benefit for the heart. And many studies would suggest that they are harmful. I don't think it's only the sugar. Ultimately, I think sugar is a component of it. And for me, what it really comes down to is what we call insulin resistance, metabolic health as I know you talk so much about, and that really ends up being the primary driver of heart disease. I want people to understand, I'm not saying that cholesterol is meaningless. I'm not saying that the cholesterol in our bloodstream has nothing to do with heart disease. It's just not the primary driver, and I don't think it's the right focus for us as clinicians trying to guide the patients as to how best to avoid and manage their heart disease. Are you saying then, before I ask my questions, we know that people who have, what is it, 50% of the people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol, right? Or there's more than that. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. It depends on when you look at this data, right? Because even the definition of normal cholesterol, healthy blood cholesterol levels has changed over time. And that tells you something, right? You know, they started with one sort of limit for what a healthy cholesterol level is. That wasn't having the effects that they thought uh, it would. They, so it they lower. lower it and <laughs> then they lower it again. And so, you know, you're right. There have been many studies over the years that suggest that about half of patients that come in with heart attacks have cholesterol levels that are below those limits. There are two ways to look at that, right? I look at that and probably you look at that and say, well, maybe cholesterol is not the right thing to be looking at. Maybe it's meaningless. The supporters of the diet heart hypothesis say, well, that just means that we need even lower limits. Even lower no, Yes. Yeah. Of course. And so, you know, that's what you kind of get into. But again, when I look at that, when you look at that, when many other people look at that, we say maybe it's not all about the collection. We're not. We need to turn our attention somewhere else. So what is the driver in your opinion? Is it inflammation? You said insulin resistance. Is it the inflammation from the insulin resistance? Like what I, is the main driver as far as you're concerned? Yeah, I think it primarily is. So I think inflammation becomes the sort of end result, right? Insulin resistance certainly drives inflammation, but there are other things that drive inflammation. We can look at something like smoking, you know, and clearly that's associated with higher risk of heart disease. It doesn't necessarily cause insulin resistance, but it causes inflammation. We know 
People, for instance, with autoimmune conditions have increased risk of cardiovascular disease independent of insulin resistance. But when we're looking at the average person walking around eating a Western diet that has developed metabolic disease and insulin resistance, that is the primary driver of their heart disease. And yes, the mechanism is partially through inflammation. There are actually some other mechanistic things that we can look at it and talk about. So I look at the insulin resistance as the high level primary driver. And again, that's great news because we can fix insulin resistance. What's for that? We can fix it with diet and lifestyle. You, the patient, are empowered. You can fix your own insulin resistance. You actually don't need me, the heart surgeon. You know, <laughs> don't need Dr. E. You just need to change, you know, re-educate yourself and change yeah. things about your diet and your lifestyle. And so what we're saying is you could have two people who have a certain number of cholesterol, and one per even though their numbers are the same, one person is still at higher risk because of all these other things that have nothing to do with cholesterol, which insulin resistance, autoimmunity, lack of sleep, this would be like our chronic night shifters, right? Smokers. Yep. So context of the number matters. And if we look at that number in that without that context, it, that tunnel vision is a problem. And yeah, and let me even take it a step further because you can have someone with a low LDL cholesterol level, and they can be at higher risk of heart disease than someone with a high LDL cholesterol level. And, you know, we are now seeing this more and more because oftentimes when people cut back on sugar, carbohydrates, and they fix their insulin resistance, we oftentimes see their LDL cholesterol levels going up. And yet we're seeing that their risk of heart disease is actually going down. Going down. And this is something that we're actively investigating. There are studies underway, but it's something I now see routinely in my practice. And I see the flip side as well, because as a heart surgeon, I see the people that come to me and their LDL cholesterol level is below any of the guidelines. It is very low. And yet they're still ending up on my table with heart disease. With heart disease. Let me ask you a question a little bit off script. So if it's too much, please tell me. The postmenopausal woman, right? We know, I try to tell it my women all the time, that once estrogen drops, their cholesterol goes up. You could have someone who's, they haven't changed their nutrition. They're a size zero. They're working out every day. They have, suddenly their cholesterol goes up. And I try to tell, there's no nutritional modification you can do for this cholesterol level. And that same group of people are suddenly also at a higher risk for heart attacks. But it's not secondary to the cholesterol. Is it secondary to this to the fact that they've lost some of that estrogen protection? What is the reason for this sudden increase in risk of heart disease in the postmenopausal woman? Yeah. So, you know, again, it's not that cholesterol is meaningless. I think we misunderstand cholesterol. And for me, it ultimately comes down to it's not necessarily it's not really the amount of cholesterol that we should be worried about. It's the quality of the cholesterol that we should be worried about. And estrogen certainly plays a role here. You know, we know that estrogen has many effects play into insulin resistance, for instance. Yes, that postmenopausal woman, their estrogen is going down, their cholesterol is going up, but at the same time, their insulin resistance is oftentimes going up. And we see the markers of that if we're looking at it in the correct way. And under the hood, kind of behind the scenes, what that means is that the quality of their cholesterol particles is changing. And that really, if we're going to talk about cholesterol, I believe the way we should be talking about cholesterol is not cholesterol quantity, it's cholesterol quality. And this gets into, you know, some of the advanced metrics that we can look at, looking at sizes, particle sizes, looking at oxidized cholesterol levels, things like that. Quite frankly, most practitioners don't do. They just stop at the basic at the cholesterol panel and that doesn't tell us the whole story. So what tests should people ask for to really evaluate the risk of heart disease? Yeah, so, and there's two categories I'm gonna put this in. Number one is blood testing, because that's what most people actually think of when it comes to heart disease. But before we even get to that, I wanna talk about imaging, because ultimately, you know, blood work doesn't actually tell us whether or not you have heart disease, and whether or not it's getting worse. If we want to know about heart disease, let's look at the heart. Let's look at the blood vessels of the heart, which is what we're worried about. And there's a very simple 
inexpensive screening test that can be done. It's called a coronary artery calcium score, CAC score. And this is a type of CAT scan that can be done. Literally takes five minutes. They don't have to put an IV in you. In most places, you can get it done for under $200, under $100 in a lot of places. And this will show us, do you have plaque in your arteries or not? Do you have calcified plaque in your arteries? And that's a great screening test. And it's also a great way to follow progression over time. If you do have some calcium and your score isn't zero, is it going up over time or is it staying stable over time? So that's really the best testing. And that's the test that I think everyone over 40 should be asking for. And if you have reason to think you're at high risk, if you're insulin resistant, if you're obese, if you have a strong family history, you might even want to start earlier than 40 on getting that test done. I love that you said that one of the like metaphors I say to my patients is, look, when I'm testing your blood, it's like me testing the water in the faucet. It gives me some information, but I'm not actually looking at the pipes. Yep. Right? If I could look in your pipes and say, wow, is there gunk stuck to the side of the pipes? Right. That's the calcification. How bad is it? How gunky is it? I cannot see that from testing the water. So the calcium score really gives us a sense of what's happening in the pipes of visual. And once again, gives context to the cholesterol because if my cholesterol is i don't know i'm making up a number 260 and my calcium score is really high it's a little bit more significance right than even the 300 with a calcium score of zero Would yeah you say that's I, accurate? I do you know and there are certain you know caveats around that you know i want Certainly. people to understand that if you're 20 years old and you have a zero calcium score that doesn't mean the same as when you're 70 years old and have a zero calcium score. Yeah, very much true. I love that analogy. I'll probably steal that from you, yeah, but I'll make sure to credit you. No, I love it. So flattery is the most, uh, or the invitation is the most, it's more flattery. So I love that. Exactly. Yeah. I give people the analogy. I say the CAC scan is the mammogram for your heart. You know, Ooh, uh, I'm going to steal we, that. We use these mammograms to detect because the hope is, you know, with mammography that we can detect breast cancer early. When we find it early, it's much more treatable. And the same thing goes for heart disease. If I find out that you have plaque forming in your arteries at a very early stage, and now we can make the changes that we need to make and do the things we need to do to stop that from getting worse, you're going to be fine. If the first time we find out you have heart disease, which sadly is the case most commonly, is when you show up with the heart attack, now we got a bigger problem to deal with. Absolutely. I have a colleague that uses CCTA a lot. What do you feel about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, so coronary CT angiography, CCTA, is a great test, but I don't think it's the screening test. And the reason that I think it's more problematic as a screening test is it involves more radiation. You got to give dye. You got to put an IV in the patient and give dye. It's frankly more expensive of a test. So sure. I like it as the second level test. If we get the CAC scan and there's reason to be concerned, you know, your CAC score is high, then certainly CT angiography gives you a higher resolution picture of what's going on in the arteries, in the pipes. The limitation of the calcium scan is it's only showing us the calcified plaque. When we do CCTA, we can see the non-calcified, the soft plaque, and we can actually measure how narrowed a blood vessel might be. I love CCTA. I use it a lot in my practice, but it's not the screening test. It's not the first test. Yeah, that's fair. And also, like you said, it's more invasive. Insurance doesn't necessarily cover it. But I'm going to tell a little bit of a story because I think it's really important that our audience really understands everything we said about contextualizing cholesterol. So I have, like you, I also have, in addition to my ill patients, I also have a lot of patients who come to me who want longevity, right? So I also have a subset of people who are very, very healthy, doing all the right thing in the marathons, eating all the, the things, taking all the supplements who don't fit the profile of the people who you would think end up on your table, right? And so I have these two people around the same age. Their cholesterol was slightly high. Uh, like, you know, again, what you do, you wouldn't expect considering, to your point, it's not nutritional. They're doing everything right. They both went for a CCTA because they were algorithmically candidates for statins. We didn't even talk about statins yet. Yep. And I really didn't feel like I wanted to put these two on statins because they just didn't fit the rest of the profile for me. It was just a numbers game. So we did this CCTA. One of them was just a little calcified. Everything was patent and open. And the cardiologist is like, no statin. And the other one with the same number had a lot of soft, squishy 
you know, but a little bit more dangerous, more narrowing, and needed that statin. Both of them, if we just went with the algorithm, would have walked out with medication. So I'm not saying everyone should get a CCTA, but I'm saying that these numbers, it's just not the whole picture. Like there's so many levels to it. I don't know if that resonates, that story that I just told. Yeah, no, I think it does. You know, now I would maybe say that the answer for the soft black may not be the statin. There okay. might be some other things to look at. But yeah, you're right. You know, and I think there are situations where getting that finer detail can be helpful. You know, kind of circling back to the beginning of this question, which was, you know, what tests should you be asking for when it comes to the blood work? Again, I don't think that the cholesterol level is the right thing to be looking at. And therefore, I don't think that targeting the cholesterol level, you know, is necessarily the right thing. I think there is some validity, like I said, about looking at cholesterol quality, looking at the particle sizes. And so you want to ask for that advanced lipid panel, or it's mm -hmm. going to be called the NMR panel. And then you want to be looking at insulin resistance. Because ultimately, you know, what I now do is, you know, I kind of step back with my colleagues and I say, okay, let's put aside the cholesterol question for a minute. Let's just say, okay, I'm going to accept that high cholesterol is bad. Every study that has ever looked at this, as far as I know, shows that insulin resistance is a much bigger risk factor than elevated cholesterol is. So why aren't you looking at insulin resistance? And quite frankly, I personally put it in the bucket of malpractice, but I think it can reach that level that if you put a patient on a statin and you haven't figured out if they're insulin resistant or not, you are not doing your job as a physician. For the patients out there that are listening, you need to ask your doctor for the tests that are going to figure out if you're insulin resistant or not. And that looks like something like a hemoglobin A1C, getting a fasting insulin level. My preferred test is what's called an LPIR test, mm. a lipoprotein insulin resistance score. And this is actually based off those particle sizes that we mentioned before, because it turns out that insulin resistance is such a powerful influencer of particle sizes that we can work in reverse. We can look at the size of your particles and we can figure out if you're insulin resistant or not. So those are some tests that people can be asking for. Many websites that you can go and order these tests for yourself. You don't even need your doctor. And, you know, like I said, if your doctor is concerned enough about your heart disease risk that they've put you on a statin or they've recommended that you take a statin, they should be figuring out if you're insulin resistant or not. Amazing. Is there a scenario where you recommend statins? So, you know, I always have the discussion with patients, right? Everything we do in medicine is risk versus benefit. You look at the situations where statins have the most benefit. This is what we call secondary prevention. People that have already had heart attacks, already had a stent, already had bypass surgery. There's more evidence for benefit of statins. And I also have the conversation that if you are insulin resistant and your cholesterol is high and it's poor quality cholesterol and you're just frankly not willing to do what it takes to undo the insulin resistance, then yeah, there's going to be some benefit to taking that statin. But understand that benefit is nowhere near as large as we've been led to believe. You know, you hear the numbers that statins reduce your risk of a heart attack by 50 percent, by 40 percent. The reality is absolute risk reduction are in the one to two to three percent range. And they're talking about relative risk reduction, which is kind of statistical trickery. But if you're not going to deal with the insulin resistance, which has a much bigger impact in reducing your risk, then yeah, go ahead and take the statin. Understand that, you know, you're going to be getting very little benefit and you're also going to be exposing yourself to the risk of being on these medications, which is very much understated. As we typically see in the pharmaceutical world, we overstate the benefits, we understate the risks, but you have to have that conversation with people and it's always a risk benefit equation as to whether or not you should take a medication. I love that. I'm going to ask in a moment about the risk of statin, but one of the things you said that I tell my patients all the time, because, you know, people come in and say, I don't want to be on meds, I don't want to be on meds, I don't want to be on meds. This is great. But I'm like, I always say, you have to choose a path. You're either going to make the lifestyle modification or you're going to be on meds, but you can't just opt out of both. You can't say, I'm yeah. on meds, pharma is bad, and then continue doing what you're doing. So choose a path. And I really empower my patients. If this is not the right time for you, 
you're working night shifts, you're not going to quit smoking, you want to eat the way you want to eat. If this is not the right time for you, let me put you on medication. Let me keep you safe. When the light bulb comes off, it comes off of it. You have to choose a path, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if the patient's willing to do the work with nice tight monitoring and frequent follow-ups, yeah, of course, I would prefer that too. So I just want to like put that a little bit on the audience, on the patients, because sometimes it's like, no, I, I don't want to do any of it, but you have to do some part of it. Tell me a little about the risk of statins. Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things that are concerning about statins, some of them in the short term, some of them in the long term. So we first have to understand the mechanism by which statins work. Statins are a mitochondrial poison. Flat out, that's how they work. That's going to have some negative effects in your body. In the short term, what we oftentimes see and what people talk about is the muscle issues, right? The muscle cramps, the, you know, the not being able to work out the lethargy, the tiredness that can go with being on statins. And so that's a concern. And, you know, some of that can be mitigated. Some of it can't. You know, on a biochemical level, one of the effects of statins is they're going to lower your levels of coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 is very important to the mitochondria, to the heart. And so I tell people that if you're going to be on a statin, you should be taking coenzyme Q10. Now, Again, this is controversial somehow in the cardiology world. There have been some studies done that I would put forth were very lousy studies that showed no benefit to taking coenzyme Q10 with your statin. But in my mind, it's just crazy. You know, we know that it lowers coenzyme Q10. It's a mechanism. And so take your CoQ10 and that's an easy way to hopefully help to mitigate some of these effects. In the long term, what I worry about is statins increase insulin resistance and you know it's so crazy i know it's so crazy. you about it and hopefully like people are standing back and they'll be like wait you just said that insulin resistance is the primary driver of heart disease and this medication that i'm being given to try and lower my risk of heart disease is making that worse and you know again you can't argue this we can't get around it like the data is pretty clear you know if you take statins for more than five years your risk of type 2 diabetes goes up, your risk of insulin resistance goes up. That is pretty problematic for me. There are some other concerns around, you know, increased risk of neurologic problems, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. 100%. In people on statins. And again, mechanistically, this makes sense because the brain is 80% cholesterol. Like maybe we don't want to be lowering levels. So, you know, part of the other conversation that people need to be empowered to have today is... Okay, if we're going to lower our cholesterol with medications, statins are not the only option anymore. They used to be. They were the first to market. But we have other options today that maybe don't have some of these side effects. And we have things like ezetimibe and benfidoic acid. We have things like PCSK9 inhibitors. I have some concerns around all of those. And I kind of step back, you know, first level decision is, you know, is lowering your cholesterol level going to be beneficial or not? But if, you know, you go through that equation and you're like, yeah, I think it's a good idea for me to have a lower blood cholesterol level, then maybe you look at some of these other options besides the statins. Yeah, absolutely. I'm reeling because, you know, in my medical practice, if someone has diabetes and I don't prescribe a statin, insurance sends me a letter. As yeah. soon as I prescribe a statin to someone who has diabetes, I get a ding in my EMR that says, do you know that you just increased a person's diabetes? And I'm like, I know, but if I don't send it, you get mad at me. And if I send it, I get mad at me. And it's like, it's just so, it's insane. I don't know. It's like, it, it, yeah, it's crazy. Like yeah, they're I'm aware really. of it and they still want you to prescribe it. And if you don't prescribe it, you can get in trouble, but you have to override the message that says, by the way, you're worsening their diabetes. It's like, it's, a, it's, it's upside down world. It really is. And, you know, again, that comes from the thought they'll point to the studies that show, well, the net benefit is, yes, you're worsening their diabetes, but, you know, the net benefit is positive. And, you know, there's, again, some studies that I think are relying on statistical smoke and mirrors to try and prove that. But the real underlying problem there is they think there's no other option, right? We can't do anything right. about their right. insulin resistance, their type 2 diabetes. So we just have to kind of, and, you know, again, you and I step back and say, but wait, how about if we just address the insulin resistance, the diabetes now goes away and the heart disease risk goes away. Like, wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, if yeah. only we had a way to do that, right? That's amazing. 
So why is it so hard to find doctors who get it? Like, we know there's not malice. Yeah. The good people went to school and they think they're helping people. What's going on in your opinion? Yeah, I think the system is, you know, has just trapped doctors into this way of thinking. And most doctors don't even understand that there is an alternative. Right. Uh, it's an, in, and, an indoctrination. You know, it's indoctrination. It's, you know, that sandboxing, you know, if every time you're looking at that electronic medical record and it's saying you got to prescribe a statin, you got to prescribe a statin. And you, as a busy doctor, just don't have time to really even think about it. And the path of least resistance is just check the box and prescribe the statin. And, you know, it can take a lot to wake people up to that. Sure. Uh, you know, can. for me, uh, you know, it was my own personal health struggles got me to open my eyes to this. And I think for a lot of physicians who do you know, get out of the matrix, so to say. It's because we either go through our own struggle or we're very impressed by something that a patient did to get out of their struggle. Oh, that's uh, but so that, true. But that's very hard. And then, unfortunately, even once you do see it, being able to put it into practice, you know, becomes the risky. next challenge. Very risky. risky on many levels. And, you know, you're kind of sticking your neck out and you're, you know, you're worried about, am I going to you know, am I going to get sued? Am I going to get fired? Are they going to stop paying me? You know, all of these things are uh, very real consequences that can happen. But again, that comes back to the physician. That comes down to our morals and our ethics. And, you know, if you know something is wrong and you're still doing it, or you know something is right and you're not doing it, I know I personally, yeah. you know, couldn't do that. I think most physicians, you know, the ones that wake up, you know, still struggle with that issue because the reality is, is this is how we make our livelihood. This is how we feed our families. We all put a lot of work into getting to where we are, and it is very difficult to overcome that, to break out of that. I admit that, but I still think that's our responsibility as physicians. We have to stand up for the patient in the end. And so, oh my God. yeah, said, that's what drives me. It's true, but you know, to like to put this in, into points, like in point one, if you're listening and you're talking to your medical doctor, there's no malice. They're indoctrinated. They learn the algorithm. They believe this is the only algorithm. They think this must be the right way. And they are doing it wholeheartedly with no malice in their heart. They really truly think this is the way. Then inevitably, like you said, they either have a life issue or someone they love has a life issue. In my case, it was my wife. And then they suddenly hit the walls of limitation of conventional medicine. They're like, wait a minute. When I went to Institute of Functional Medicine to get certified, everyone there has to be a clinician first. And everyone there had that story of like, well, this happened to me or this happened to someone I love. And I started digging. Then you go through this process, just like you said, of like someone's taking the cobwebs off your eyes and you're like, what? I didn't know all this existed. Now, everything you learned, there's still a lot of goodness in what you learned, but now you've learned this whole other set of tools. And I remember when I first got into this, I was so terrified. Like now I have all these podcasts like you, but I was so terrified. I spent like I went on the my podcast, I talked about water and hydration. Like I was really scared to say the things like gluten causes hypothyroid. Like I was scared to say all these things. They're going to call you a quack and you're going to get ostracized and some troll on TikTok or something is going to come at you. And you have to really build thick skin and you have to really be willing to be like, listen, I can't unknow what I just learned. But it is a process. It is a process. Coming over to the side as a clinician is a process and there is risk involved. And if there's, God forbid, one bad situation, which may have nothing to do with you, it really could take you down. So that is why it's hard to find a doctor that gets it. <laughs> oh, we are a few and far between. But it brings me to, you know, towards my last question was, it sounds like you need a doctor and a health coach to get through this. I think health coaches can be very valuable. I have two of them that work within my practice. And quite frankly, they do a lot of the heavy lifting because it's one thing to know the theory of all of this. It's one thing to understand that, but it's another thing to actually put it into practice in your day-to-day -day life. And that's where I think a good health coach can be in invaluable. And, you know, to be quite honest, in a lot of situations, you don't even need the doctor. You need the health coach and you make the changes and, you know, you go on with your life. But I understand that, you know, people oftentimes want the medical practitioner overseeing that. And so I think it's an ideal situation to kind of be working Agreed. with both. And I think they're very complimentary. Agreed. I also have coaches because you can only spend so much time going over like the nutritional stuff and things like that. So you're there to kind of manage the pharmaceutical questions or anything like that. But 
what people need is, well, how do I eat and what do I eat and what do I do and how can I cook this? And do you have any recipes? Like the real kind of daily decisions you have to make in order to incorporate this into your life, the health coaches are so important for that, 100%. Is there anything that I did not ask you that you want to maybe tell when I think we're going to get Yeah, no, I think we really hit the high points for people, you know, so again, the high, you know, I guess one thing that I would reiterate is patient empowerment part of this, you know, you the patient, you the listener out there to take charge of your health. And you can't rely on your doctor to do this for you. You can't rely on the healthcare system to do this for you. And I believe that our role as physicians is to educate and empower our patients. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to give you the information that's going to allow you to make decisions about what you want to do and what you need to do. So I always emphasize to people, take back control of your health and that takes effort. Health is not a passive process. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) you might not be able to just go to the doctor down the street that the insurance company said to go to. You might need to find the doctors that are aware of this stuff. And maybe you need to travel a little bit. Maybe you need to get on the internet. You know, we have great technology that we can see people by telemedicine. Maybe you need to pay a little money because your insurance isn't going to pay for that doctor. And these are all things that people might need to do to get to where they want to be when it comes to their health. 100%. So tell everyone where they could find you, your books, how they could work with you. Yeah, sure thing. So I Fix Hearts is really where to find me everywhere on all the social medias. You can go to my website, ifixhearts.com. My book is called Stay Off My Operating Table, and it's widely available at all the usual sources. I have a telemedicine practice. We see people across the United States and even internationally. And as I mentioned, it's a big team effort. I've kind of just been amazed at this point, you know, four years in how big a team it's become. And we're really looking to connect with people and empower them to take back control of their health. I love that. Thank you so much for being here. And prior to this, I, I, we heard about, I heard about how crazy busy you are. So taking this time for me and my listeners is really appreciated. And yeah, whoever's listening, find Dr. Avadia. Start working with him. He's amazing. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure.